I should load up the track listing for Shoots to Narrow. <laughs> but in order. <laughs> I don't I don't have it in order for some reason. Okay, here we go. Wikipedia has it. So Kissing the Lipus, man. You know, it's kind of a dissonant chord. It's like a major seventh that it starts with. And so to me, what I was thinking was My Bloody Valentine. So I was thinking that, which is so weird. I mean, it doesn't sound anything like that stuff. I'm playing it on acoustic and stuff. But probably when I had written it, it was more droney or something. So it started out as that sort of a thing. And then just the rhythmic side of it, I think I was just searching for something different, something unique rhythmically. And it kind of became this, yeah, sort of upbeat, angsty pop thing. That fuzz solo, and that's actually like the Sansamp plugin that they used to have in Pro Tools <laughs> is the fuzz. I didn't have a proper fuzz pedal <laughs> at the time, but I remember using that to great effect often. I would always put it on the snare. It wouldn't allow the snare to be on the record unless I ran it through the Sansamp plugin. Yeah, I quite like that song. It's popular. I mean, we, we always play it live. That song, in a way, Kissing the Lipless, the title is kind of an inside joke about Neil, our old bandmate, who we all adored, but was kind of in a state where he was just too distracted, I think, <laughs> to play in a band and go on tour all the time and stuff. But uh, we would give him shit because he kind of didn't have any lips. He was kind of, <laughs> he kind of was one of those guys with just no lips, you know? And I guess I had certain animosities towards him. I think he, of all the bandmates, struggled the most with the transition from being in Flake, where we were all four partners and wrote together and shared the money and did all that. He just really struggled, I think. He was struggling with so many things at the time, but one of them was directed at me, and it was that now I'm this fancy pants songwriter guy, and oh, I'm, you know, he just was waiting for any moment for me to get a big head or something. So he was always he was always just sort of at odds with me, you know, felt like any decision I made was dictatorial and and stuff. And so we just kind of struggled. So I think that's me. It's about him, but it's also about like ex-girlfriends that I, you know, it's like when you're writing a song, you just kind of use whatever you can do to get the damn lyrics written. You know, he's in there. He was such an important relationship for me. Neil Langford is the guy who met me in like 1989 when I was fresh from England, came to the States and just graduated high school. And he was in a band, he was in a working band and he was like 16, but he was in a band that would play nightclubs and stuff and get paid. And he and I just really hit it off right off the bat. And he is the one who really, you know, he would encourage me to play like, dude, do that song. I know you know how to do that. Credence Clearwater Revival song. Just play it for them. You know, we'd be drinking beers or whatever. He'd be like, play it. Watch, show my friends. You can do it. He is that guy, you know? And then he invited me to join his band just as an, you know, um, like a, what, rhythm guitar, you know? And I just knew how to do cowboy chords. But he was like just very encouraging and, you know, liked hanging out with me. I loved hanging out with him. We just had a similar sense of humor. We were just one of those friends where you just like, you know, crack up all the time and you know immediately you can just kind of look at him and he'll know what you're thinking about whatever's going on you know and you just both start giggling and stuff so he was that guy he really changed my life in that way he he i was shy and you know i uh, i wanted to play music and i wanted to get into that stuff but um you know i was shy so it was hard you know and i didn't know anybody but he just really took my hand and got me on stage so it was an important relationship and it just kind of it kind of fell apart and there was a lot of stuff that led into that there was substance abuse and you know and then the the change of this sort of power dynamic shifting cuz he and i used to write most of the stuff i would say for for flake you know and um but i totally reconciled with him and we became really close i mean Whenever I was going through something difficult, I could talk to him and, and he did the same and he was going through a lot of stuff and we were there for each other for years, for the last 10 years, which I'm so thankful for, you know, and it, it is hard because it's, you know, I, he was somebody I would talk to once a week, you know, 
And I still have those moments where I, you know, it's that thing where you go, oh, I'm going to, I'll call Neil, I'll tell him or I'll send this to him, you know, and it's just bizarre. You know, I have the same thing with, uh, with Richard Swift, you know, you just, um, it's just that thing. It's like you keep grieving because it keeps, you keep thinking that they're alive. It's a strange, strange thing. And I, 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 it's only in the last five years that I've begun to experience this. You know, Flake was a, playing the nightclubs in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and so it had to be kind of rock and roll. It had to be loud, generally. And, and I think Neil's tastes were sort of more along the lines of Super Chunk and stuff like that, so pop punk stuff which I enjoy too, but it just, I started wanting to do something different. I was longing for the music of, I guess, my youth, you know, um, like I said, Echo and the Bunnymen and stuff. I was like, I was longing for those moments in music where you actually get the shivers, you know, and you don't really get that from certain types of music that are great. But I guess I was like, wouldn't it be cool to be able to pull that off, you know, some sort of delving into songwriting to the point where you can elicit that sort of response. But that stuff doesn't work on stage in 1996 in Albuquerque. It just doesn't. You know, you can't bring up an acoustic and sing a little folk number. It's just not going to work. People are shit-faced. They're doing shots of tequila, snorting lines in the bathroom. You got to bring it. 